as uh, on minimal access uh, or minimally invasive surgery. And uh, the idea of you know keeping it as a topic for uh, somebody who's just in second year is to just surprise you of a different way of uh, surgery uh, presently being practiced as as compared to what you hear about you know uh, surgery uh, say in past. So the usual way of uh, operating has actually changed, where uh, something like in you know, a minimally invasive excess into the body part or in the body cavity has gained importance or, uh, or prevalence that um, uh, these days bigger incisions are not given to achieve a goal of major surgeries. So this is what the topic is for today. So what is minimal invasive surgery is, is actually a new approach which was started you know, way back, I think in the early uh, 1980s and uh, it is uh, gradually picking up. And for many procedures in surgery, it has become procedure of choice. So this is actually a new approach which accomplishes the major surgery without inflicting the, the major or longer incisions. And therefore, it spares patient of longer incision. And the importance of minimally invasive surgery can be understood when I'm saying that you know just spare patient of consequence of longer incision. And one can imagine if a long incision is given in the midline of the abdomen, the abdomen post-op period, whatever is the surgery or the the kind of you know anesthesia one would give to this patient, the patient's always going to be having you know, some pain, and he will have a, some guarded uh, say a, approach towards inflating his abdomen while taking deep breaths. So therefore the patient is going to be breathing well and therefore the oxygenation and the respiratory movements or the, or the ventilation of the lungs is going to suffer. Same work, uh, uh, the patient is going to be facing another problem just in case the sensation become infected, then he has wound infection or if this incision does not heal well, then the patient is going to have hernia or insane hernia, which I believe you must have been introduced to uh, in anatomy, where hernia actually means there's some breach in the abdominal wall, which leads to abdominal contents protruding through that defect, which can be acquired following operation. It can be kind of congenital, which has uh, now the congenital orifice has extended in size to actually lead to hernia. So hernia, wound infections, extreme pains, therefore uh, uh, respiratory compromise and many more consequences can happen because the long incision, longer the incision, the more are the chances that you know the person is going to have such a problem. Now when we're talking about you know, minimally invasive surgery, it means that any surgery that involves minimal invasion or minimal cut, accomplishing what is required to be done in that particular patient, but it is not synonymous with laparoscopic surgery, where lapar laparoscopic surgery actually means approaching the abdomen. Laparos means the abdominal cavity. So approaching the abdominal ca cavity with a scope is called uh, laparoscopic surgery. It's not synonymous because you would hear from me that minimally invasive surgery is now practiced for many other things, not just the abdomen. So it's done for the thorax also, where the lung resections and you know esophageal resections and the mediastinal tumors to uh, uh, pleural cavity collections are now tackled by a scope which is called thoracoscopic surgery or video assisted thoracoscopic surgery, VATS, V-A-T-S. So thorax can be approached by a minimal invasive route. Abdomen can also be, the pelvic organs can also be, even the varicose veins can be approached by introducing your scope or telescope under the deep fascia and tackling the communicating veins which are going from superficial to the deep venous system, which are called perforating veins, and you just kind of control them by clipping them or damaging them or burning them or cauterizing them so that the connection between them is lost and therefore the pressure in the deep veins should not get transmitted to the incompetent superficial veins which are lying under the skin. Therefore, these veins will not distend and thereby treating a person or helping a person of his or her 
varicose veins or that is varicosities of superficial veins. So even varicose veins, thoracic surgery, abdominal surgeries, thyroid can be tackled by minimally invasive means. So therefore, as I'm supposed to narrate the advantages or disadvantages of the minimal invasive surgery, so the advantages by the that you are capable to operate without a long incision and therefore the incision related complications are gone. You are able to operate, this applies to the thyroid, the feasibility to operate from a remote size that can be hidden by closed or natural creases. So for example, thyroid is getting in, uh, operated by approaching from the axilla. We're gonna be giving a small neck and going under the skin and subcutaneous tissue to reach the thyroid and then operating there with the use of minimally invasive instruments. So here, either it gets the, the incision gets hidden under natural creases or under the clothes, and therefore the, the cosmetic deformity does not happen. And therefore, if the wound complication happens, one is it is very unlikely because it's a small incision. And second, if it happens, you know, it happens with low magnitude. Now, capability to operate through natural orifices or natural tracts, where I'll just give an example that the times have come, where from an anal orifice, you're gonna be putting a, a single port-like thing. So you can imagine a rubber plate can be put into the anal orifice, just on the mouth of the anal orifice, which has got few uh, holes in it, through which many instruments gonna go along with one telescope which will see the inside of the anal canal and the rectum, and then it's going to operate on rectum. And for example, if you want to operate outside the rectum, you're going to be making a hole in rectum at some place and put your instrument out of the rectum and then operate on the adjoining area and you know deliver that so-called uh, deceased area or, or for example, a mass lesion or tumor through that opening into the rectum and get it out from the anal orifice and finally closing that rectal wall. So this is the extent to which the minimal invasive surgery has reached. The other benefit is going to be promoting a quicker recovery. So you can imagine if person did not, did not have a long incision abdomen, his respiratory function is not going to be suffering. He will not be having a lot of pain post-operation. He is not very likely to have any complication and therefore is going to recover quickly and will go home. So promoting quicker recovery. And secondly, what has happened here is that organ failures in the form of liver, because the unknown or autoimmune diseases to the alcohol release uh, related diseases where the livers are failing or the kidneys are failing because diabetes and hypertension being very common pathology these days as lifestyle diseases uh, in our population, that the kidney failure and liver failures are pretty common and therefore organ donation or the organ transplant is required in a in big number in plenty so when you when you have to motivate organ donors if you can tell them that you know with a small incision we would be able to get that organ out from you thereby you would be helping somebody else or your relative or a near one or dear one to get a donation then this donor is going to be more than happy to actually donate, provided other factors are taken care of. So therefore, it just promotes, in fact, in one way, organ donation. It allows inspection of suspected disease area or organ spaces, like an abdomen, if somebody has a chronic abdominal pain, and you're not able to decide on the disease even after CT scans and, and you know, heavy investigations imaging, then the last resort is going to be that you want to open that area and just see what is wrong. Now with laparoscopy, you can make, punch in a few holes and just pull in your instruments and just see the area inside and decide. In case sometimes what happens, the disease is actually medical disease where you just need a histological confirmation where you would be able to take a sample and process it in pathological uh, uh, setting to get the diagnosis and start somebody on medical treatment. So this way, it can help you take sample. It can actually help you see that area and diagnose. And in case some act would be required on the laparoscopic or minimal invasive route is capable enough to take care of the disease that's ailing this patient. In addition, it's going to be promoting family planning procedures by offering less invasive means. And what I mean by this is uh, talking about a very prevalent way of family planning, that is female sterilization, where we're going to be clipping, you know, uh, 
uh, uterine tubes or fallopian tubes so that the pregnancy does not happen. Now with a small puncture at the periumbilical area, you can put in a scope which has a side channel in built in it through which you can actually uh, t take your instrument, clip or hold this uh, tube and just put in a clip so that you can occlude it. So this way, when you're offering somebody a minimal invasive route of family planning, people will be forthcoming to get it done. This is gonna help the society and the country together when more people would be willing. Because in our country, more than male sterilization, the female sterilization is the one which is practiced or accepted more uh, for family planning procedure. So therefore you got to find, you had to find a route where the where women would be willing to actually undergo uh, situable ligations in a minimally invasive way. Now look at this picture uh, uh, where, you know, the first picture shows an abdominal incision, a midline incision that's skirting around the umbilical scar there and almost spanning from top to the bottom. This would have been given for a major surgery and look at the ABC down, you can see a lot of complications of an of a, uh, abdominal incision where you had a kind of scar where your unhealthy granulation tissues underneath and who knows bowel is showing in the middle one. The, the, the gangrene or the damage to the tissues has happened that's you know black gangrenous area is seen in adjoining skin is pretty red. And the third picture means that the abdomen was sutured after uh, thorough uh, say toileting where the abdomen has been sutured and a drain has been kept just to get you know some uh, some expected material infected material that would collect in the post operative or post intervention period so look at the effort that has gone into an infected scar because it was big because maybe it tackled the abdominal contents where you know the intestinal intestine intestines were open, therefore the contents touched the skin and therefore led to maybe infection, which is inevitable. Now look at this uh, picture, uh, that, uh, say by the side of this uh, long uh, abdominal incision where this lady underwent laparoscopic right me, and you can see four small scars through which you know, one could actually perform such a major surgery, approaching a renal and taking out a uh, adrenal tumor, sorry. So therefore, that there lies the importance of you know minimal invasive surgery. Now look at another way. This the first picture shows a thyroidectomy scar in the neck. Then you can see the on the right side of it, a lady showing just a small scar in the axilla through which thyroid was approached and finally taken out. The the things have extended to to the extent that you know go go kind of you know clockwise starting from the pyrodectomy scar that is open surgery scar and you know come back to the uh, come back to the picture uh, next to the axillary incision which is being shown by a black arrow uh, look at the a picture you know marked as b here you can see one port which is telescope actually which has got a camera in it is actually going uh, between the chin and the lower jaw and uh, therefore, uh, you can see, uh, you know, one bigger port going towards the thyroid and showing things and, you know, two side ports or side instruments are going. In addition, one port is, one instrument is going from the axilla aiding this thyroidectomy. Go further on the A side, you do not have an axillary uh, support here. Now, just the three ports are doing the job as compared to the four there. So there are different ways of doing thyroidectomy here. One is axillary port solo. The other one is axillary along with the intraoral approach. And the, another one is just the intraoral approach. So the technology has got advanced. And I will tell you how it has actually, or what has contributed to make this uh, kind of you know, procedures possible. So another picture just to show an open procedure. Then you know there is a procedure where you can see three scar, one, on, one just above the navel, then you know two side scars there so together they just accomplish uh, the laparoscopic procedure then there's something called cells coming where sin single incision laparoscopic surgery is coming where just the one incision in the region of umbilicus which is going to be much bigger than the incision here which was meant for just the camera port here it is meant for many ports so it's going to be bigger one you're going to be putting one port uh, which will have three four holes through which you know 
uh, there are three, four instruments going to go and accomplish your surgery there. So the problem with the single port is because then all the ports or all the instruments are going to be fighting at the point of entry. And therefore, it becomes much difficult to operate through cells as compared to traditional laparoscopic procedures. So minimally invasive surgery inside, outside may be minimally invasive, inside it's a complete surgery, so it's a major surgery. And therefore, it requires as much of preparation as uh, for an open surgery. And the person should be psychologically and physically fit kinds, physically in the sense because patients are undergoing major surgery. And psychologically, maybe patient has phobia whether the surgery is going to be complete or not. It's going to be as safe as, as uh, you know, one uh, think about in the surgery these days. You will have to, you know, uh, make patient confident about going in for his surgery through laparoscopic or minimally invasive route. And wherever I'm using laparoscopic, most of the principles are applying to the minimally invasive surgery. So I'm just kind of using it in interchangeably because MIS has almost become synonymous, but it is not with the laparoscopic surgery. The problem with the MIS is that it requires a lot of training than maybe an open surgery. That doesn't mean that the open surgery is very easy, but yes, because in open surgery, you're going to be opening that area of interest and you're catching things very 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 you know directly as long as you have uh say required uh training you would be able to you or you are expected to do a very good job with the open surgery as compared to the minimal invasive where you're going to be op uh, operating from remote area with you know sleek and needle-like instruments uh, held uh, in your hands and, uh, uh, and uh, the assistants now going to be assisting you pretty well as compared to open where he can actually put in hole if you have got two assistants and four hands, that means they can retract so much that you can actually see the area of interest and operate, you know, fearlessly. That doesn't happen in the minimal invasive route, so therefore, it requires a lot of training experience in this technique. Whenever indicated in the interest of the patient's safety, you got to be ready, whether depending upon whether the pathological condition is incurable uncontrollable by minimal invasive route or the patient's safety is, is uh, coming under threat or if surgeon's not experienced enough to tackle that particular thing which he had actually planned because the finding inside just turned out to be something uh, grave then he should be having an option of converting to open and he should be very proficient with open surgeon too. So as, as has been practiced the medical care is primum non nocere. So do no harm. Now, initial patient evaluation should consider the indications and contraindications for minimal invasive surgery. So if you're actually operating a person with minimal invasive route, one important thing is whether that patient is suitable for the minimally invasive option or not. So there are indications and contraindications which I'm supposed to be mentioning. Due to variable level of experience of surgeon, and sometimes the surgical pathology also shows you know, variability inside. There are no hard and fast rule that there are indications or contraindications. So uh, uh, I'm just checking you know, that I'm audible and the screen is showing. Just in case it is not, so somebody can watch up. Uh, Kundu can definitely. So if I'm not, otherwise I'm just continuing. So because a lot of variabilities are there, there are no hard and fast rules about indications and contraindications, therefore, and even the term like absolute contraindication must be taken as a guideline only. It's not a kind of hard and fast rule. Also, somebody says uh, absolute doesn't mean absolute contraindication. If the surgeon is pretty confident about his surgery and his technique, he can still operate when there is a, a kind of absolute contraindication. So absolute contraindication. When laparoscopy or minimal invasive route started, there were a lot of contraindications. People said that, you know, if there is a previous operation in abdomen or chest, one would not like to operate with minimal invasive route because then a lot of additions are expected and you won't be able to reach your area uh, without dissecting too much into between the organs to free them to give you a safe passage to accomplish your job. Now, with a lot of experience and safety gadgets, the, that kind of contraindication has gone away. So, therefore, now contraindications are few in number. And it is presently said that you know, if a patient is not suitable to undergo a major operation, that's the only contra. 
So therefore, advanced and safer anesthesia technique even further decrease this contraindication. That's you know the question of whether the patient is safe to to be taken up for operation. Uh, then only he'll be considered as a safer bet for a for a minimally invasive surgery. Now even that that uh, particular aspect is being taken care by anesthetists where the advanced and the safer anesthesia is being offered to. So patients who have severe cardiac disease who will not tolerate variable and odd patient positioning. The one thing with the laparoscopy now I'm going to just mention here is that for any minimal invasive procedure, you've got to be putting in a patient different position. So for example, if I'm talking about operating in the esophageal hiatus, just under the dive from where, from where the esophagus is coming down, converting to stomach. So if you want to treat, if I want to treat the disease there, I will have to put patients in such a state that patient's head is extreme up and legs are down so that everything falls down and I'm able to see hiatus, which is generally overlapped by the left lobe of the liver. So I'm going to be retracting left lobe of the liver and retracting spleen on the lateral side, left lateral side, liver on the right side. Then only I'll be able to see the hiatus. So it requires a lot of position. Now, for example, if this patient cannot sustain such a position, I'm operating in an open area, I would accommodate because I may not put him into a, a very extreme position. In fact, I will ask my assistant to do hard work, to retract in such a way that I can see. But that doesn't happen with minimally invasive uh, surgery where you resort a lot on, or you depend a lot on the patient positioning along with somewhat um, help provided by your assistant. So here, um, patient positioning is extreme and is very crucial, very vital. So if patient cannot be put into that particular position, then he is not a candidate for MIS. Cardiac and respiratory illness, if makes CO2 insufflation. Now, because this is one aspect I didn't really touch. Whenever you're operating in a minimally invasive way, for example, the thyroid, the perithyroid area will have to be distended. Carbon dioxide has been found to be a, this, a gas which if gets absorbed by in, in blood, uh, when a blood vessel is going to get opened up during dissection, it easily dissolves and is excreted through the lungs. So this is something, it doesn't really accumulate and lead to air embolism. It is very well taken care of a healthy lung and uh, it, is, it, it dissolves well. So therefore, it is found to be very safe uh, gas to be used provided uh, the the uh, respiratory and cardiac system is capable enough to excrete it. So therefore, cardiac and respiratory illness is going to make CO2 insufflation a concern, and therefore, this patient is not going to be a candidate. A patient who sustained a trauma or some kind of bleeding, or for example, somebody has a gastric ulcer or a gastric tumor, bleeding in the in the body is too extensively that the patient is unstable. You don't want to put a lot of instrument because then you require careful putting in uh, three to four ports and then you know going into that area with 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 a, uh, say incomplete or a suboptimal retraction and a lot of positioning then only you'll be able to see and you can't really go into that area to see what is bleeding so when you do not have that much of times better you do not select mis so hemodynamically unstable bleeding patients mis may not be suitable Exception is going to be rupture ectopic, where a lot of uh, surgeons adopt minimal invasive procedure, where they would just enter into the abdomen. They know from prior imaging that the tubes are bleeding, one of the tubes, not both of them. So they would just catch all of the tube, or if not, at least they'll put in a pressure there with the gauze piece inserted uh, in, into the abdomen, and they will suck all the blood. And just once the blood goes away and tubes are seen, they can just catch both tubes or maybe culprit tube and just and catch it with one of the instruments because tubes are pretty small and instruments are pretty capable to just uh, you know catch that. So once it is uh, held, it's not going to bleed further, and then you would just control your situation and deal this uh, uh, this tube. So therefore, this is one situation where the MIS is still an option. Now, intestinal obstruction, which has led to distended bowel filling whole of the abdomen, becomes a contraindication because I'll let you know later. So the first step in the laparoscopy is that you'll make a small neck and you'll put in a needle-like instrument and attach it to the gas uh, CO2 gas tube so that the gas is going to enter and abdomen is going to distend. 
After that, you will be putting little bigger instruments, which are five millimeter or 10 millimeter in diameter. And uh, now uh, they should not strike vowel or enter into the aorta straight across or enter into omentum and lead to bleed or so many things or damage liver or spleen while putting. So when the bowel is distended, there's always a danger of, you know, uh, say damaging them and this becomes a concern. Multiple previous operations, particularly now here I'm saying multiple, not just single, but just in case you have a situation left upper high or left hypochondrium, left upper quadrant becomes a very safe bet where a lot of additions are not expected even after multiple previous surgeries and you can do that. Or if there is a doubt, you can give a small link into the uh, periumbilical region. Just dig, you know, step by step till you reach the, the uh, linea alba. You're going to be cutting it under which will be a, a peritoneum. You're going to be, you know, uh, say, casting your uh, blunt artery forcep or instrument, a blunt instrument through that peritoneum to make a breach so that you're not putting sharp instrument, making a hole into something which is sticking on the undersurface of the umbilicus. So you're going to be thirsting, uh, 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 say, blunt instrument and entering into the abdomen in an open way. So that's the answer. Morbid obesity, a lot of fat is going to be there in abdomen. What is there outside is actually there inside too. So these big patients become very difficult to handle. Then pregnancy beyond five months because then the pelvis is going to be all filled with the uh, gravid uterus. And secondly, once CO2 goes into the uh, abdomen or anywhere, it is excreted by the uh, lungs. In the process, it can just lead to hypercarbia of the fetus and that might not be acceptable to many. So therefore, it becomes contraindicated. Chronic illness or problematic uh, endotracheal intubation with the trachea cannot be intubated by an endotracheal tube, which will be connected to the uh, ventilation equipment, which will ventilate a patient during operation. And um, once the patient's paralyzed and keep him, uh, you know, keep the lungs ventilated, if that is just not possible, this becomes a contraindication. The malignancy, if you feel you cannot really handle malignancy pretty well, and tumor appears very, very likely, then, and the surgeon is an experience, the better that you know you avoid procedure in there. So that's another contraindication. Now, the, quickly, I'm just going to be going ahead with the uh, um, uh, uh, rest of the thing. So appropriately conducted informed consent to address the risk and benefit of minimal invasive procedures, very, very imperative, and it just applies to MIS as it is to the open surgery. Then information about conversion to the open operation and capability of the person or, or operator to tackle the disease in an open way to complete the job has to be informed to the patient. Then you can even tell patient with the videos or pictures or models or whatever that, you know, this is what I'm aiming to do. That just helps a patient. Then informed consent in the layman language and that, that applies to any surgery and anticipated positioning of the surgery and therefore the consequences arising out of that can be explained to the patients. Therefore, as I said earlier also, advantage of MIS is going to be a quick recovery, less pain in the local site, the less chances of infection and obviously the, the one of the bigger concern here is cosmetic concern or cosmetic benefit that the less scarring would happen and because less infection would happen, that scar would disappear very quickly unless it gets you know, infected. Those infected scar, as a consequence of infection and, and, and aggressive healing, would lead to pigmentation in that area. And therefore, there will always be a pigmented scar and it will not be spotless. Now, caution about progressive. Now, when, when you're aiming to operate such patient, uh, any patient by MIS route, you've got to caution them that in case I'm doing it in the abdomen, if a patient presents with the progressive nausea, vomiting, or fever, or continuous constipation, or abdominal or pelvic pain, then he should inform because this is one aspect that MIS, what happens uh, that you know, you can imagine that you know, if there are three holes with two holes, surgeon is holding two instruments, and with third holes, your assistant is holding a scope that is a 10 millimeter tube, which has got a optic system attached to it which can show a picture or the video on the 
on the cam uh, the, on the monitor then uh, you would imagine that the person is seeing what his assistant is showing at the tip of his telescope he's not showing is seeing anything in the rest of the abdomen and while handling while putting or taking his instrument out he can just unknowingly damage any organ which may present later so unknown injuries are known and with, which occur to more tune as compared to the open one so you got to be guarding the, those patients about this so preoperatively patients are seen in one or two weeks prior so that you plan well a proper history examination weight blood pressure condition of lung and heart needs to be seen then abdomen needs to be palpated if it is if you're talking about laparoscopic surgery you should do it yourself examination and see okay whether the organs are in uh, enlarged what am i uh, you know supposed to do uh, while making ports and then you know hernia if present that needs to be tackled complete bimanual pelvic examination should also happen along with the abdomen when pelvic now pre operative planning the surgical team should actually sit down and do little planning before mis and when i'm saying mis that applies to other area also all the principles may not and one can really correlate as to what applies to which side what applies to thyroid and which to thorax or which to uh, abdomen but i'm in general talking about abdomen at the moment so if the pelvic conditions are expected then uh, patient should be told and the surgeon should also plan that bowel resection may be anticipated just to uh, break additions sometimes bowel injuries do happen and the bowel resection and bowel repair would be required so the one should actually plan and inform patient also and therefore bowel preparation that is bowel cleansing should happen because once the bowel gets opened up you know unexpectedly all the contents going to come out into the abdomen and lead to abdominal sepsis to avoid that bowel has to be cleansed and all the procedure of bowel preparation that's called bowel preparation have to be adopted in case you're expecting a bowel injury that can happen maybe one person but then you have got to be ready in matter of creating pneumoperitoneum should be planned where the trocar is going to be placement of the and location of the trocar is going to be identified and possibility of injury to unlike bowel blood vessel urinary tract that is distended bladder or ureter during operation depending upon the difficulty level of the procedure should be planned discussed with the relative or patient and the surgical team should also plan and you know take evasive action so operation table now on the day of surgery and otherwise in general in a minimally invasive procedure the operation table should be right in the center of the room this will allow access from all area as this high, uh, highlights or underlies one fact that you know in a minimally invasive procedure if for example if you have to mobilize right colon you're standing on the left side of the patient putting in a different port and you got your two instruments going through two holes in abdomen you going to be mobilizing the cecum and then it will be carrying on to the hepatic flexion now it's a big area so if you're standing on the left hypochondrium you would be looking diagonally opposite into the right hypochond right iliac fossa if you have to dissect in right hypochondrium better you stand on the left iliac fossa and just direct your instrument straight instrument there you keep changing position so therefore if you have to mobilize whole colon then you'll have to come on the right side to actually dissect the left colon so therefore you got to be changing position so the area should allow you to change position and also to allow you to put your monitors in the respective position so for example if you're mobilizing right colon you're standing on the left colon you have straight instruments or scissors in your hand long scissors of laparoscopy then the monitor should be on the right side of the patient so that you're looking in the monitor if you're dissecting the left colon now then the monitor has got to be left side so it is said that you know monitors should be on both side or maybe leg or head end depending upon what you're operating if you're operating thyroid better that the monitor should be on the head end of the patient so it should allow a lot of movement of the instruments and the staff or equipment or the doctors or surgeon the patient should be correctly positioned and I, and i've already emphasized too much about positioning that you know to to uh to meticulous position is very much required then patient should not slide so anti skid devices should be used which can come in the form of gel pads gel foams egg crate foams and bean bags for positioning then orogastric tube can be put so that the stomach is not inflated and not does not get injured when you are accessing abdomen 
Same as for the urinary bladder, either you put in a Foley's catheter or ask patient to actually void prior to operation. These patients are put in awkward position for a longer duration because minimal invasive surgery might take longer than an open procedure. So therefore, the veins, because the stasis that you was, as you would read uh, more uh, about, you know, uh, venous uh, thrombosis in the legs and in, in uh, you know, further topics, uh, the one of the reason for venous thrombosis is stasis. Venous wall damage, hypercoagulable state, that's called virtuous triad, uh, and uh, stasis of the veins are the reason for thrombo uh, thrombo uh, thrombosis. And a part of thrombus in the leg vein can just detach and can get stuck in the pulmonary circulation leading to pulmonary embolism where the circulation is going to stop from the to the heart and the lung both suddenly and the patient can have a sudden, sudden demise. So therefore thrombosis of the leg veins is to be avoided by thromboprophylaxis where you're going to be giving drugs which will thin the blood and make it less hypercoagulable or less coagulable or hypocoagulable. Even then, uh, in such a situation, so that when the stasis happens, even then it doesn't lead to thrombosis. So uh, thromboprophylaxis becomes an important part in the minimal invasive surgery as compared to the um, maximally invasive surgery. Now, this is just to give an idea. Look at the open operation. What is happening here is one assistant, one surgeon. So that's a surgeon, that's assistant. You've got a tray in which you know, a few instruments are lying. You've got an IV stand. Uh, you can't see anesthetists here, but you know this is the suction thing where whatever is being sucked through the tube is going into suction. You can see some material there. Then the bags are handing, uh, hanging of IV fluids, which is running. This is what you require, and obviously top line, that's just illuminating the area, which you want to operate in a clock. That just uh, tells you how much time is taken. Central AC in a view box for the X-ray. So that's the usual um, operation room. Now look at the laparoscopy one. You've got extensive uh, uh, monitor, uh, a keyboard to control few things. Then you got you know one, two, three, four, you know four, five instruments which is going to be aiding. And look at that long, sleek instruments. These are laparoscopy instruments which is going to be uh, helping you to perform your activity after you put in something like pores. So what you actually do is you create a hole, a small cut into the skin. And then you take a, a tube, a tube-like thing through which these slender five or 10 millimeter instruments are going to be passing. But of that five millimeter size, there'll be cannula, blunt, blunt tubes, blunt solid, uh, say, sticks are there, which is passing through this cannula, which has got a very pointed tip. So you, you kind of trust uh, the, these instruments. That is the cannula. That's the hollow tube in which a pointed trocar has been inserted to go through the abdominal wall to reach abdomen. So once it reaches abdomen, then you take out that inner solid pointed uh, uh, trocar and do that hollow tube. Now you're gonna be putting these slender instruments which are lying on the tray. And then you're gonna be uh, doing your surgery. A lot of people are watching, but you know, a lot of cost involved into all these gadgets. You need an uh, additional uh, uh, biomedical technician who can take care of these things because surgeons are not going to be going and touching this one and you know, certain things. After all, these are electronic things. So because you're relying on electronic thing, it's just like you know at your home sometimes you know when you're working with the washing machine suddenly conks off. Now your work is stopped. So so therefore you're relying on gadgets in minimal invasive surgery, and everybody can see your surgery. It's very good for demonstration and for recording and for seeing uh, and, and, and people, other people can even suggest. So your senior or experienced person can just look at the monitor and even suggest, okay, do this, do that. So that's the kind of beauty or the, or the, or the usefulness of minimal invasive surgery. That's another picture where you can see actually one, two, three, three monitors. So as I said, monitor should be there so the surgeon can see here. The assistant, this assistant can see her, or maybe even one assistant if her, he can see this way. So the, the lot of cooperation comes. Now look at the gadgets here, one, two, three, and a, and a costly trolley, which has got a lot of gadgets installed, the electricity board, 
customized polys are there. You do not need working top light at that time. I mean, you, you switch them off. Otherwise, they're going to be creating glare and therefore you won't be able to see, see things properly. So minimal invasive surgery is done in a dark environment as compared to the maximal invasive where you do it in the illuminated area. So that's a, the illumination in minimal invasive surgery is inside, right? You can see in the monitor that you know how illuminated it is. That's another way. Now, what is added to the minimal invasive surgery here is the now the robo are doing this surgery. And this, if you look at the picture, this is what I was talking about. You can see this port, which is for a central hole here. I'm pointing to this, through which those slender instruments are going to go. So the, here in these holes, the 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 pointed uh, trocars are going. When you're trying to push it in into the abdomen after giving a skin incision, skin is something which cannot be pierced by any instrument except blade. So once you give it a neck, you should be able to put this assembly of cannula and trocar together and then bring take out the central uh, trocar and put in an instrument. So these are the different ports you can see and the, uh, the person's trying to operate on that side. I do not know which, where is the head in. Now, all these, when you're going to be putting these instruments here, they will be attached to one of the arms, one, two, three, four arms of the robo. You can see, you can attach them here, then the robo is going to be uh, uh, controlling and you would be giving commands. The most proficient um, robo these days is called Da Vinci XI. So this is, this is uh, the most kind of prominent or effective robo one has in at this point in time. Uh, and there. So now the cost of robo is also getting added to the minimal invasive surgery. So what is the difference between open minimal invasive? It's pretty costly. It's very, very precise though. And it is aided by the gadgets. So with that, I'm just going to be mentioning the minimal invasive surgery equipment. So what do you need is a team, which is got a surgeon, for second assistant, a scrub nurse, an oxirculating nurse, and a biomedical technician, which has said, who's going to be taking care of video camera, the laser equipment, the lasers are also there. Some high-tech equipments are there, and they have to be thoroughly checked prior. Then commands in the operation room can be voice operated. Now, near the, the situations coming that the surgeon can actually, uh, like Alexa, can, can communicate or control the light, the, 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 the uh, resolution of the uh, system which is showing on camera, everything, the tables, movement, the endoscopic equipment, the cameras, the capture system, the information network source. And a back table should be there to hold all the instruments as I shown in the picture also, the slender instruments are lying on the tray, that is back table on which you know the instrument should be there. And the instrument of open operation should always be ready to do a quick, for example, the bleeding happens suddenly and you're not able to tackle, you just try for a second and it doesn't really happen and you realize that it's become very, very um, filthy situation or difficult situation. You're gonna be just taking a blade and opening the abdomen of wherever you are, whether thoracic, whether it's thyroid, wherever. You're gonna be opening in that uh, directly over the disease and just catch hold of the bleeding or whatever. Bleeding is the one thing which requires immediate. Otherwise, even if bowel opens, you know, you, you can't do much it and you don't should, shouldn't really be panicking. So open instrument and a back table for the, for the uh, say, additional minimal invasive uh, instrument should be ready. That's another way of, you know, now what, what I just want to point out, which I've already done in a lot of instruments, cautery, this, 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 a lot of instruments are required. A lot of monitors are required for minimal invasive. So, what comprises a minimal invasive surgery is a video imaging and capturing. So, modern video cameras are based on solid state microprocessor chips are there. So, it is chip based. So, one chip, two chip, three. Now, cameras have involved, and these are three chip cameras. Now, what happens? That you know, or maybe I would just go back. Now, look at that. Imagine this is 10 millimeter telescope. It is steel one in which the viewing system is installed. It has got a hub here on which the light cable is going to be going and this will travel, the light is going to travel from here to the tip of this one. Therefore, the telescope is going to be showing light, throwing light also at the same time, the optical system will be capturing the, the picture. Which will, be, which will be processed by this camera head. So that's camera head, this whole assembly. 
this is the eyepiece of this telescope on which the camera head has been connected. So that's called image one HD camera head has been attached. To this wire, this is gonna be going to a processor image one. So that's called camera console or camera controller or image processor. This will decipher what this camera head is seeing. And then this is gonna give an output to a monitor. The monitor is gonna be showing like this. So you've got a telescope, you've got your camera head there, the camera head from this cable is now going into the camera processor. From here, the cable is going to the monitor and then monitor is showing you the things, right? So just going back to the original thing. So therefore the cameras have evolved, their camera head attaches to the eyepiece, the camera head now controls to the camera controller by cable and from the camera controllers goes, goes to the display. Quality of the video signals in the display both have advanced along with the technology. So the video signals which this camera is sending and the quality of the display or the monitors all, all become very good that combined they're showing such a good picture trying to match what eyes can see. So image display depends on resolution of the camera and the monitor. Therefore, how good the camera is gonna be capturing and how good is the monitor is showing. So the monitors and camera both are available as 4K now. So 4K high definition endoscopic video cameras are now available. The widescreen monitors are available, which just show you a bigger, better picture. An optical zoom is also there. When you press that button, it's gonna be zooming into that particular area and showing you that particular small area of a detail just in case you have a little doubt about you know, what is happening in a particular area. Combination telescopes are now available where at the tip or at the eyepiece of that telescope which I showed you in the picture, you have got a camera uh, system also. Now this is an integrated camera chip which is mounted at the distal end of the laparoscope. So at the tip of the uh, laparoscope, not at the, cam at the eyepiece level, a combination ca camera is, you know, camera chip is attached, which is going to be catching this picture and uh, will be transmitting it to the uh, so called the camera controller and will showing you the picture because the chip is there right on the tip, the pictures are much better. And this is just for the sake of mention the 4K format is actually horizontal resolution where the standard is a vertical resolution. And what I actually mean is that the vertically counting, how, how many pixels are there in a vertical line in a, in a monitor? The more the pixels and obviously more clearer the picture lie. So a vertical resolution actually means that how many horizontal lines you can read. So vertically, if one after another, you know, pixels are there, for example. So if you draw lines across those pixels, then, you would be able to see many horizontal lines passing through those pixels if you draw horizontal lines actually. So vertical resolution means that how many res uh, horizontal lines you can make and horizontal resolution means that how many vertical lines you can make. It's just that the numbers actually. So 4K is more times better than 1080 that is HD resolution. Now this is combination system where this is, these are, these are looking like a little finer. This looks like a bigger telescope 10 mm, this looks like a small one. So even 5 mm, the 3 mm, 2 mm telescopes are also available depending upon what you're doing. And I just forgot as I'm talking about 2, 3 mm, there is, there is uh, something called VAP system, video assisted anal fischler treatment, V-A-A-F-T. So VAP system is also there, which is using three, three French, actually, um, uh, uh, three French uh, combined system, something like a combination system. We're going to be putting into the perianal fistula, and perianal fistula is that in the perianal area, because of the infections traversing from the anal canal, if the perianal area has an abscess that is pus collection, that pus extends, grows, grows, grows till it ruptures in the perianal skin. And now everything's going to be healing except there'll be a crack. So there'll be a crack which is going from the perianal uh, region where there is a hole, and this is going deep into the perianal, perianal surrounding tissue. So a, a fistula or a sinus is going to be formed. Sinus has no other side. Fistula has one side as exterior, other side as a bowel lumen. So these wrapped system can be put into that uh, orifice, 
and the track can be seen washed with some liquid or saline and then it can be damaged so that once this track is damaged it is going to adhere to each other the walls going to, and it will get obliterated so small fine scopes are also available not just 10 mm 5 mm 3 mm are all available now depth of perception becomes an uh, important issue when you're putting in a telescope you're just seeing left or right or up and down you do not see the onwards that is the depth of it so depth is absent this hampers the hand eye coordination and uh, because as you're working with the eyes you can see 3d so for example if i see in such a way that you cannot see what is the depth and if you have to go to the depth extend your hand and pick up something then you won't be knowing how far do i go deep so on a table if you're working if you do not know how deep is the thing depth on a table you do not know you'll be trying to reach to it and you may not succeed in first attempt all because to be measured so 3D image systems are not available, now available, which provide 100 degree articulation. Now articulating chip on tip design and dual optical channels now enable a system to become 2D and 3D both. So I'm just mentioning the kind of advancement we have. Then in addition, the help, the, the usefulness of MIS is video capturing. So whatever this camera controller, which I mentioned, which is going to be processing the signals of uh, the camera head and will be sending into the uh, to the monitor while it is sending to the monitor it can send it to your pen drive also if you attach it on the back side of the camera controller so the documentation of the video is very very uh, is a very good uh, say, uh, facility available to you this helps in documentation, it helps in record keeping, it helps in showing it to the patient what we did. It is done in the high resolution and it is a document and, and therefore it can be taken on a CD, DVD, pen drive or directly to the printer also. So you can share it with, the, with, with your uh, say, colleagues, uh, with your students. Later on also, you can transmit them you know, directly to a, a screen kept for the general viewing. You can record it for showing it to the patient, to the relative, to your students later. So that's, that's the benefit of, of, that is benefit of extreme uh, learning that happens with the MIS. That's a 4K system. So just again, and just don't tell, and probably you would understand this camera system has got camera head, there is a wire. This wire is going like this, must be going to the camera controller or camera processing unit. CPU, you can also call it. There's another side channel through which the light cable is going and going to the light source, which is going to be throwing light, which will travel through this fiber optic of fluid cable and will illuminate the tip like this. So the light is coming from here, going into this channel, for example, going here, sorry, this channel, and then side channel illuminating it here. The light comes out here, shows the operating area, and therefore this camera can, can see you. Uh, things which you want to operate. In addition, for example, if we are talking about the abdomen, even thyroid also, you have to put in a cannula through which uh, CO2 should go in and distend that area so that it becomes capacious for you to work in. So insufflation should be there for insufflating the potential space. So for example, the varicose vein surgery, even under the deep fascia, we distend that area so that we can see things properly for the instrument to move around. So that means introduction of CO2 in the potential space. Various techniques are available. Most techniques utilize something called a VDS needle, which is a spring-loaded reusable needle. And it is used, or it can be limited use, or it can be completely disposable. Just read this thing. I'm going to show you the picture, the sharp outer sleeve. So it's again a cannula, which is got outer sleeve, which is very sharp and point. Here, the outer one is pointed. And the inner sleeve is a blunt whose tip is going to be ending into a kind of blunt tip, which is retractable. So what happens if all this assembly has got an outer sheath, which is very sharp, it is an outer tube whose margins are very sharp and beveled to which the uh, inner cannula is going, which is protruding way slightly beyond this outer one. So when you're putting it, thr th uh, thrusting it uh, through the abdominal wall, Whenever there will be a pressure, this inner tube is going to get retracted because it is spring-loaded. And the sharp outer tube is going to be poking. 
So once it is going to be reaching abdomen, what happens that the inner tube, which is spring loaded, will suddenly come out and will save the bowel and other structures. So that the inner tube and you will and the and the person who is putting the needle will get a sense that it's hitting somewhere and he's going to hold his hand movement, right? So the spring action, as I mentioned here, spring action should be checked whether it is working or not. So this is what the tube is. Inner tube, which is got a sharp edge. You can see here the sharp edge, outer, sorry, not inner, outer. The inner is retractable. So whenever it's going to be putting pressure against something, this will go in. And this will lead to the penetration of that wall. Well, if this is the peritoneal lining and you're coming from outside to inside, once it is going to be here, our uh, inner tube is going to be puncturing the abdominal wall till it reaches the inside the abdomen where this retractable thing will protrude like the way it is shown here. This will protect. So that's V reach needle. Then insufflators are there. Insufflators uh, warm the CO2 also. And uh, these are there, there are external equipments are there which can hydrate and warm the gas in addition if it is not available in the insufflator. So insufflator displays the insufflator insufflation pressure, intra abdominal pressure, and generally you keep intra abdominal pressure within 15 mmHg, uh, 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 mmHg uh, because beyond this the IVC will get compressed and the preload to the heart decreases. So you want to restrict yourself under that only. The best way, best pressure to work with is 12 mmHg or lesser. Insufflation volume per minute, the speed with which it is going, and the total amount of gas that has been used, it will mention all three things, all four things. So that's the insufflator where you can see it has mentioned that 36 liters already gone. 15 is the set point, 10 is the rate with which it is actually going. I believe I can read that. So four things are showing the intraabdominal pressure being 15, probably that's that's a amount of the gas that's gone one this is the rate actually with 18 liter per minute i can see liter per minute here somewhere so liter per minute that's the speed with which it is going 36 liters already gone kind of so it's just two minutes i believe 18 liter per minute so in two minutes 36 liters going to go 10 is the pressure 15 is the one which you've set that will not exceed beyond 15. Right, so then is the light source I've already said, so I'm going to go uh, through this in a quickly. Adequate light is very essential. Good illumination is going to give you clarity and true colors. Halogen and xenon are the light sources commonly used. Xenon is preferred better than uh, halogen because it gives a true white light and almost true natural light. The, the light source of the fiber optic fluid fiber optic cable which i mentioned is going to be connecting the light source to the laparoscope to the side port of the laparoscope the sheet which you saw fiber optic a light cord should not be kinked or bent it should be kept in a, in a tray uh, coiling it like in circles rather than acute bends otherwise the fiber is going to break and the light source will not work the other end of the light shows the, the end which is touching the, the scope or which is attaching to the side port of the telescope generally gets heated and it can actually lead to fire of the drapes. So you have to preserve it or keep it away from the, or should not be pointing it directly to the drapes or clothes. So the other thing which I said, that's a telescope, for example, it is the side hole where the light source is gonna fit. This is on which camera head can be put. And if the light source is working, if you do not have camera, you can actually peep through your eyes and you would still be able to see things properly, but it will be very taxing on your eyes. The other thing which is happening here is that, uh, that uh, you can see that the, uh, the telescope is bent like this. So what it does is that if you preferably want to see the lower side here, then this camera is very good as compared to, I'm not seeing something which, which can show you upwards something that can show you le less acute downwards and downwards and there are straight also that's called zero day. So these are the angles. If straighter one, if this line is a zero degree, then if, if that is the line it is making, you can measure the angle it is making, right? So because then, then you look at this, this face here, you draw a line across the center of it like this, and this is where this is this is going to be the angle with which on with which it is showing. So telescopes are 
identified by their angle. And these are the instrument, fine instrument. This is five ml. So this is this is just the picture of instrument. These are finger grips, and these are maybe graspers. Like this is these are tooth graspers. So these are the instrument which which uh, will be going through the ports and helping you in doing the minimal surgery. This is just an example. That scissor painting. This is a kind of grasper which is got in a hole punched in it so that it doesn't really put a lot of pressure onto the tissues which you're going to be holding because the pressure will be relieved here. So tissue will not be crushed. That's a long grasper. That's a little cupped kind of grasper. That's scissor. This is again a grasper which is called ridges or, or serrations on it for a better grip there. And this is a grasper or a kind of dissector which has got a slightly pointed edge so that you just poke it and open it, open, close, open, close. You can dissect into the tissues um, as you must have done in the dissection halls. So that's the end of it. In case you've got any any question about you know, this one, this was just an introduction to what minimal invasive surgery is and its benefit, its procedure, what are the incisions like, um, uh, and then I'll be happy to answer that. You know? So uh, let me know if there are any questions. I have not actually seen any query if you had in the uh, in the middle, but uh, maybe let me just run through that. Okay. Right. I had just a confirmation from everyone that I was audible. I thought I was looking at some other place for the answer, and answers were coming. I couldn't really see. So anyway, we cannot type in the chat box. We have access only to the question box. Okay. Fair enough. I don't know why, because I'm also not very, very good with this, these systems. So uh, I do not know what to say exactly. But in case there is any question, anything anybody wants to ask, I'll be happy to answer that about explaining it uh, any further. In case uh, none is coming, then uh, probably I can just uh, stop the presentation. Uh, that's it. I hope that's the final thing, you know, um, uh, I'm understanding that probably there are no questions there, so I'm going to close it. I'll keep the attendance of all of you, right? Okay, then thank you very much for listening.